Blockworks president Rob Bowles is here to discuss the digital dystopia, along with news from Nerdio and Dell. Plus, we interview Huntress Labs CEO Kyle Henslova on the rising threat activity against MSPs. It's Channel 4 Weekly, episode 134, Million Dollar Coffee Maker. Today's episode is sponsored by Corporate Armor. Get free remote support software exclusively from Corporate Armor. Stop spending big money on expensive remote desktop tools and use Corporate Armor Connect and Fix for free. Connect and Fix is secure, reliable remote desktop software that enables you to support clients and fix their technology issues remotely from anywhere, anytime. Connect and Fix runs in a fast, secure cloud offering commercial grade and compliance friendly remote desktop and support technology for free. It includes features like file transfer, session recording, restart and reboot, and live video and text chat on PC, Mac, and Linux platforms. Users can even share their screens with clients for presentations or training purposes. So stop paying for remote access and support software and switch to Connect and Fix by Corporate Armor. They take the pain out of sourcing IT products. Find them at CorporateArmor.com. Again, that's CorporateArmor.com. Hello and welcome to Channel 4 Weekly, episode 134. My name is Matt Whitlock, Technology Editor, Online Director, and your captain of this ship that is Channel Pro Weekly, where our passengers, you, are the MSPs, the VARs, the integrators, the IT service solution providers, the computer builders and fixers. If you do things with technology and other businesses are involved... You are likely in the right place. If you are not in the right place, there are exits there, 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 and there. Okay? Uh, <laughs> joining me each and every week is our, uh, our awesome co-host, uh, the man of the hour, the, the frequent traveler of, of uh, places near and far, executive editor, Rich Freeman. Yeah, and uh, I, am, I am back just a few days here from my most recent trip to uh, Poplar Grove, Illinois. And hold on to that, because we are going to talk about that as we break down what your awesome adventure was. But we are not alone. We have a third with us today, an awesome guest host. We've been looking forward to having him on for quite some time. Mr. Rob Bowles, founder and president of BlockWorks. Welcome, Rob. Hey, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Appreciate you guys. It is, uh, it is great to have you here. Um, we're going to go ahead and we'll, let's talk about you a little bit first, and then we're going to learn a little bit about Rich's recent travel adventure. But for those uh, who, who don't know who you are or maybe not familiar with BlockWorks, uh, can you give them a the little skinny about you? Yeah, sure. Uh, Rob Bowles, founder and president of BlockWorks, grew up in the enterprise, uh, clients including Fortune 500, Fortune 50, city, local county government. Uh, maybe some foreign consulting might be mixed in there somewhere. Can't really talk about that, but uh, data centers, complex wide area networks and security. So last 21 years and, and uh, it's interesting to see the universe kind of come full circle now with security. So top of mind to emerge out of those. So you know, yeah, Ab absolutely. Here. So uh, tell us a little bit about BlockWorks and uh, what you do there. Yeah, BlockWorks. So we, BlockWorks is really, you know, when, when you leave a, a corporate gig and you start a business, initially you, you just, you're a business, you got to grow like everybody else. But what happened for us is it just reached a point where it made sense for me to go back to my roots. I refocused the entire business back on security. That was in 2016. And then we kind of realized all of our clients were, were coming from peer groups and other MSPs. And so in 2018, I made the decision to go channel only. We've been channel only for over two years now. We've kind of been undercover, but yet, you know, I think just last week we, we added our hundredth partner. So a little below the surface that we work with very high standards and some very, you know, high levels of certainty, if you will, which kind of changes how we approach things. But, but we are a master managed security service provider and, and uh, you know, I'll actually be out on the road with, with channel pro this year. So look, looking forward to it. Yeah, I mean, that, that is exactly, so we're very excited to um, have you uh, on the road with us at Channel Pro. We, we do, as uh, regular listeners know, a regular series of uh, live uh, events, and we've got five of them uh, on the calendar this year, and Rob is going to be uh, speaking at, uh, at those shows. He's going to be part of a panel that is specifically about managed security, and, um, and you just use the, you know, the magic phrase there, um, managed security service provider or MSSP. Yeah. Uh, and that's one of those, those terms that gets tossed around a lot, but there's a lot of ambiguity about what it actually means. 
Um, and so, I mean, I know one of the things we're going to be doing in that session you're, you're part of is defining some of these terms. From my perspective, and uh, maybe yours as well, an MSSP is somebody with some really sophisticated, usually expensive talent on site, its own security operations center, its own SIM, SOAR kind of infrastructure, as opposed to an MSP who provides some security services to their clients. Yeah, it's great, great breakdown. You know, we have a peer in the channel, and I won't mention any names, but he broke it down better than anybody I've talked to. And, and he, he laughs when people come up because he always asks me this question. He's like, Rob, do you guys have a help desk? Do you take general support calls? And I say, no. And he says, yeah, that guy's an MSSP, right? So, <laughs> yeah. funny so now, So now looking back, Rob, in 2016, when you made the decision to focus on security, I would think that was a pretty good idea. What do you think? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, when I started the business, all, actually all the way back in 2006, I had three things that I've always weighed everything I've done in technology against. Security has always come first, even all the way back to the early days when malware was really just an inconvenience, but security, reliability, and a positive user experience, right? Because it's a perpetual balance between security and usability uh, with budget. But but if you go so far on a security scale that your users can't get work done or you destroy morale, well, that's not productive either, right? So we, we found that being mindful of those three things really made sense, so. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, given, given the rise of uh, uh, security-related uh, concerns these days, especially around MSPs, I would say you definitely are pointed in the right and lucrative uh, direction. <laughs> yeah, well, we, I knew which way it was going. I didn't know to the extent it would evolve, you know, especially now with neural networks and AI and weaponized AI and some of the crazy stuff that's happening there that is kind of even scary to talk about. But, but yeah, security was always going to be a concern because it's a perpetual balance, right? The, the opposing forces. So good versus evil comic book stuff, but it's, you know, in our context, it's real life. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, welcome. And uh, thank you for, uh, for being here and go guest hosting with us. Um, I know we've got a lot of different stories to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, Nerdio, who's got some, uh, some uh, venture capital news and some of the things that they're doing. Dell is in the news this week with some new promises. Uh, we're going to talk about digital dystopia, a little bit more about that. Uh, we also have a great interview coming up with Kyle Hensloven from Huntress Labs. Uh, very exciting interview uh, to talk about some of the things. We, we actually mentioned a little bit last week, and we'll get into those a little later in the show. But Rich, the biggest news is, is from your return, as you said, into the great uh, uh, wonderland that is northern Illinois. Tell us about this uh, magical trip you went on. Yes. Well, uh, last uh, Thursday through Sunday, uh, I, I cashed in some of those uh, frequent flyer miles. I made my way out to O'Hare. And from there, courtesy of Matt, who actually picked me up at the airport, I went out to his hometown of Poplar Grove, Illinois. I was hanging out with him and, uh, and his family for a few days. And we had, uh, we had a blast together. We went, so actually, I mean, we, did, we did a bunch of fun things in and around the Poplar Grove um, area. But um, First full day we were there, we went uh, into downtown Chicago itself, and our very first stop was um, the uh, office of Joanna Sabrin, who is this year, the very first Channel Pro Peer of the Year award winner. Um, we're going to be doing this every year now where we, we identify a, a member of our audience who has especially important and applicable and, and helpful uh, information, peer-to-peer uh, -peer device sharing information for our readers. Um, so the first ever winner of that is uh, Joanna Sovereign, who's the CEO of MXO Tech in Chicago. And um, it was great that uh, the timing worked out such that Matt and I could go to her office and personally present her um, with her award plaque and uh, meet her team and check out her office. That, that was awesome. Um, so we got a chance to do that. She's been on the show just within uh, a few weeks, a few episodes ago for, um, for folks who uh, listen and watch regularly. Yeah, and then it was, let, me, let me interrupt you there for a second. It was, yeah. it was a great trip out uh, to see her. And um, we have some pictures posted on social media if you want to check that out. Uh, and those who want to uh, hear from Joanna herself, we did have her on the show in episode 130. Uh, so if you want to go back in your, in your timeline there, you can listen to that. And we have a, a nice interview with her. We're talking about lots of different things like that. Please continue. 
And, well, I mean, beyond that, we, we did all sorts of um, fun stuff that visitors to Chicago and, and its outskirts do. We, we, we went to the Willis Tower, formerly the Sears Tower. We uh, had dinner at this uh, awesome sort of old school German restaurant in Chicago. Uh, Matt took me to a, a hockey game. He's a huge fan of the Rockford, Illinois Ice Hogs. I got to watch the Ice Hogs play. Um, we went out to... Uh, to Woodstock, Illinois, um, which unbeknownst to me until just a few days ago was actually where um, Groundhog Day was filmed. And I got to kind of see the, the square where all the um, Groundhog Day festivities took place and take a lot. So, you know, it was just a blast, start to finish. Um, it was a lot of fun. And I always enjoy hanging out with Matt and his wife and his kids and uh, other colleagues from Channel Pro. And uh, it was just a great trip. So uh, it is also important to note that if, if for those who, who may not listen or, or watch the five minute roundup on YouTube, um, you will absolutely want to watch last week's uh, because um, shenanigans were afoot. <laughs> I will just say that. Rich, you want to want to tell them about that? Uh, I'll just say that, uh, yeah, I, I made a huge um, strategic error, basically. Uh, so a year ago, I went out to visit Matt. And while I was there, I said, hey, can I borrow your, your set, like where he's sitting right now, for those of you watching on video, because I've got to record a, an episode of the five minute roundup. Didn't really think much about that. I just went up there to record and like towards the end of the episode, Matt comes in and starts kind of messing with me a little bit, because he could. Um, so, you know, given that experience, you'd think I'd be savvy enough not to tell him I needed to record from his home again. And in fact, not only did I tell him, I told him like three <laughs> days in advance. I gave this man 72 hours to figure out what, what could he do to really mess with Rich. Uh, and it just, it has to be seen to be. So, you know, it, funny thing is we were talking about security and some of the stuff we're going to be um, talking about on the, uh, the Huntress interview that we're doing, like really serious stuff. And chaos is going on all around me, and I'm just kind of talking through it. So please check it out. It's it's like nothing else you've uh, you've ever experienced in the uh, IT news business. How, uh, Go ahead. how was your experience trying to focus through all that? <laughs> you know, I, I felt like I did a reasonably good job, um, actually, of uh, of you know maintaining the thread of what I was talking about and, you know, <laughs> pausing yeah. a little bit when some weird hat was put on my head or something like that. And then just kind of going back. I, I think I pulled it off, but uh, uh, viewers will have to decide for themselves. Yeah. And for those, for those who want to go check it out, I will just give you the theme. Rich is very cold. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> it's very, very cold because it's Northern Illinois. And he was, he, he just seemed cold. Like, and I, I was not cold. Him. I was worried about him. He was very cold. <laughs> Rob, go check it out later. Uh, those, who, those who are uh, listening or watching, go to youtube.com, the uh, channel for network uh, page there, and um, find the five-minute roundup. You will, you will laugh. It was, it was funny. All right. Um, so uh, Rich, it, it was a great time having you out. Uh, I hope you had a good time and hope uh, you, you'll want to come out and see us again. Although you seem to be bad luck for my ice hogs because it's the second <laughs> game you've been to and they've lost both times. I know. I know. I'm starting to worry a little bit here. I'm <laughs> owing two. But, uh, but don't worry. They've lost a lot lately. I don't think it's just you. <laughs> so, you know what? Uh, very, very quickly, for the benefit of folks who are watching on video, I'm going to pan up here a little bit, and you can just make out my Ice Hog sock puppet uh, up there. <laughs> there uh, it is. Yeah, the sock, mo the sock yeah, monkey bobblehead. Sock monkey, right. Yeah. There, <laughs> there was a giveaway. So that was great. Up there hanging out with the iguana. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, you, you, a big, uh, you a big hockey fan? You like sports? Love sports, love sports. Actually, wish I would have grown up someplace that plays hockey because that's that's a sport that uh, it's just it's got a nice mix of everything, right? So, sure does. Fast pace, not a lot of breaks, uh, a lot of hard hitting. What what do you what do you what do you follow sports wise? If it's not uh, hockey, you mean like teams or are you just yeah, uh, teams teams sports in in general? You know, these days it's. Uh, you know, I live in San Francisco, so the Warriors, they've been so exciting to watch over the years. Def definitely love the dubs. And, but other than that, my heart's, my heart's out east, so the Steelers and the Penguins. So, you know, uh -huh. keep, keep a close eye on them, and the Pens are really they're, – they're having a nice little season kind of quietly despite the injuries. So, so you're not a Niners guy? Uh, no offense to my local peers here. I am not a Niners fan, so – well, after what happened in the Super Bowl, it's probably for the best. 
Yeah. Well, Santa Claus got his Super Bowl ring, right? I mean, that's like, I think the most endearing thing for all of us to see Andy Reid get over the hump because that guy yeah. has been a great coach and deserved it. So, yeah. Very true. And I was, I'm not a huge football fan, but I was rooting for the Midwest. So I, I got my <laughs> wish. <laughs> all go. right. Well, we are going to, we're going to go ahead and dive straight into the news. Uh, Rich Nerdio has raised some venture capital to do what? Yeah, you know, um, interesting uh, developments. So let me tell folks who are new to Nerdia what they are about and why this is sort of a, uh, an interesting milestone in the evolution of that company. So um, you go back, uh, I want to say 15 years, basically, and there's an MSP in Chicago um, that comes up with this idea that it would be really great if we could essentially assemble all of the um, elements needed to run an SMB network and a digital workplace and put that all online and stream the entire thing to our customers. And if we would have it centralized in a private cloud, it would be easier for us to manage and control and update and patch and so on. Not very easy to do 15 years ago, but they came up with a lot of um, really great technology that allowed them to do that efficiently. Um, and then quickly realized, as often seems to happen these days, that what they had developed for their own use was actually a product. And so um, they created this, uh, this company, Nerdio, to sell that technology to other MSPs. So originally what they were all about um, is, is selling this um, virtual workspace technology to MSPs, uh, kind of a, a network in a box, IT as a service kind of solution. Um, originally it was all hosted in their own um, data center. Over time they added the option, maybe you wanna host this in Microsoft um, Azure instead. And so they started offering that hosting option. As they did so, they accumulated a lot of expertise in Azure. Um, so they, they got to be a company that really understood um, how to get an MSP started in, in Azure and get an Azure practice going. And then more recently still, Microsoft comes out with Windows Virtual Desktop. And if you're a regular po podcast listener, you know we actually did an interview with the CEO of Nerdio about Windows Virtual Desktop because, you know, we certainly at Channel Pro believe this is the next Office 365. It's a huge opportunity. And Nerdio is all in on, uh, on WVD as well. So all of that is context, basically, for what happened this week. They announced that they have accepted a, uh, an $8 million funding round um, from a venture capital firm called MK Capital. Um, they're going to put that money into expanding the business internationally. They're going to put that money um, into accelerating the product roadmap. And they're going to put some of that into forging more uh, alliance relationships with third parties. Um, so, um, you know, you, you go back two years and there was basically only one distribution deal that, uh, Nerdio had in place with SureWeb in Canada. Um, just within the last few months, they've, um, added, uh, alliance agreements with Ingram Micro and Pax8 and DNH. There are a lot of other companies and companies that aren't distributors, a lot of other companies that are interested in the Microsoft Cloud and Azure and WVD who would be interested in forging, um, uh, partnerships with Nerdio and bandwidth, you know, just resources has been an issue on the Nerdio side of that. So now they're going to have some money that they can use to um, talk with more of these vendors and uh, create more of these deals and sort of expand the offering. Um, so it's, it's an interesting development for Nerdio as it sort of evolves past its original focus to being the, you know, th their mission, the, the, the thing that they want to be known as is the go-to source for an MSP who's new to Azure, come to us, we're gonna make getting up and running in Azure and monetizing a business and managing it and optimizing, we're gonna make all that easier for you. We've created a bunch of tools that eliminate a lot of the complexity and uncertainty and, and risk there. Um, so they've been on that evolutionary path, they've now got this infusion of capital that's going to enable them to, uh, to head down that path even faster. And um, you know, they said that uh, these days, 60 to 70% of the leads they get are WVD related. So I think last and not least, <laughs> this story is sort of a, uh, an illustration of the speed with which Azure is becoming a focus area in the SMB channel for SMBs. And WVD in particular is just still, uh, I mean, it's barely a year, it's not even a year and a half um, old that it's been in, in production. It's still a very young product. It's still accumulating um, subscribers and so on. But that opportunity is expanding rapidly, and this venture capital firm placed an $8 million bet, basically, on Nerdio as a company that's gonna be able to um, capitalize on and profit from 
the growth, the forthcoming growth of, of WVD. So Rich, uh, they're going to take $8 million, and what are they going to do with this $8 million that they weren't already doing as they were growing out their, their presence in virtual desktop and the things that they're doing with Azure? They're going to do, I mean, um, the three priorities that they outlined are all things that they were doing before. They're just going to be doing more of it faster, right? So, you know, they're going to be moving down the product roadmap faster. This money is going to enable them to add capabilities um, and, and get them out to market um, even sooner. And I'll, I'll just drop a hint. There may be some examples of that coming in the news um, relatively shortly. Um, they're going to be expanding overseas. So, I mean, they do business overseas now, but they're going to have some resources to, to open overseas offices, support overseas customers. They'll do that faster. And then, um, you know, like I was saying, they have and have been signing um, alliance relationships mostly at this point with distributors, but now they'll be able to do more of that and really sort of attach their platform, their product um, to systems from other vendors and, uh, and really be part of this whole um, Azure ecosystem and WVD ecosystem, both of which are really um, maturing and expanding right now. All very good uh, avenues to, to go down. I, I also hear that their break room needs a new coffee maker. And with $8 million, I think they might be able to get one. Uh, and, now, Rob, uh, now, <laughs> that's just the first million dollars, right? I mean, you've still got seven <laughs> to spend on the other stuff. So it's all well, productivity, yeah, it, right? <laughs> it's, it's $299 for the coffee maker and then several hundred thousand dollars for the, uh, for the coffee to go with it. Now, Rob, if you had $8 million and you were Nerdio, would you buy coffee or would you do the things that Rich was saying that you would do? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. There would definitely be some coffee, but I, I think there'd be more str strategic uh, emphasis as well. You know, n these niche players, ourselves included, you come in and, and your biggest value and your biggest ability to, to provide value to partners is stay in your lane. You know, don't get, just stay in your lane. Don't let the shiny objects come around and, and pull you away from your focus. So. So you, we've seen an explosion in interest in virtual desktop even the last year as Microsoft has kind of finally gone down that path of providing Windows as a service. What, are, what, what do you think about that trend in, in, the, in the industry right now? And as a, as a security person specifically, what, are there more security implications to that or less as more desktops get virtualized? Um, you know, Existing in zero trust now, we're essentially validate everything prior to passing, if you will. It's just still fundamentals, right? Whether it's in the cloud or premise, you got to stick to the fundamentals. And like what we see, especially, you know, in this subject around the Azure uh, deployments is the shared security model of, you know, AWS, Azure, these guys that are deploying it, they're rolling the resources correctly into it, but they're not leveraging the same security they would premise based because they have this illusion that it's protected by, by Microsoft and it couldn't be further from the truth. So there, there's very uh, widespread minimal use of true security in those cloud resources. And that's a conversation that's going to have to come up sooner or later. And I'm sure the folks at Nerdio are working towards that, but in general community wide, a lot of MSPs I, I hear and meet and talk to at trade shows are, well, what do you mean? You know, I'm just using the, the basic security that's in Azure. And it's like, oh, no, that's, that's not a good idea. So, so I mean, the, you know, because I was going to ask um, basically for your, your general take on the security of, you know, workloads of any kind that are in, in Azure. Is that a secure platform? And it sounds like the answer is that it all depends on you. I mean, if, if you are um, exercising the same diligence that you would with an on-premises system that can be secure, um, but, uh, but otherwise it could potentially be just as vulnerable as a server in somebody's closet. In some cases more so, you know, because it's, it is publicly accessible. It is just hanging out on the web. And if you consider that, I think last year, statistically, moved up into the beyond 99% of all breaches are directly associated to configuration error, you know, misconfiguration, capital one, great example, right? So if you're not using the right tools and you're not configuring it correctly, how secure really is it? It's not at all. So. 
Yeah, agreed. All right. Well, I think we're going to move on from that story. There's, uh, you know, anytime these companies get large amounts of money from venture capital, uh, I always like to say, um, you, if you would like to share the wealth with me, uh, just send me an email, <laughs> podcast at channelpointnetwork.com, and um, I would be happy to take any amount you want to give me. Um, because, because why not? <laughs> I need coffee too, darn it. <laughs> All right. Uh, so Dell, Dell is also in the news, Rich, this week. They are promising simplicity and consistency for partners in 2020. Now, this is very similar to the message that they had in 2019, where they promised simplicity and consistency for partners in 2019. Uh, and, and it was also very similar to the story in 2018, where they promised simplicity and, uh, what was it, uh, consistency for their partners in 2018. I'm seeing a trend, Rich. Is it actually happening this year? <laughs> well, it's been happening, um, actually. And, you know, th this is, it's, it is very much a, a, a recurring theme, a trend um, over there at Dell. Um, uh, and I should say, I mean, you know, we're talking about it on this episode. This news actually broke last week. Um, we recorded a little bit earlier in the week than we normally would because I was flying out to Illinois. But um, we're right at the beginning of Dell's fiscal year. Um, and they, they did sort of a virtual kickoff event online where they talked about what, what's coming up for the partner program um, in the year ahead. And, um, you know, it's always something that's going to be of interest to partners. If you partner with Dell and do a lot of business with them, you're going to want to know what they have in mind for the partner program. But especially true this year, because there's some back end um, reorganization going on over there. The, uh, the former uh, uh, president, COO uh, of the company, um, uh, Marius Pace, uh, I believe I'm pronouncing his name correct, um, has left and he announced some months ago that at the beginning of the new fiscal year, he was stepping aside to, uh, to focus on other areas uh, of his life. Um, and so what, uh, what they did over at Dell was um, take somebody who was in charge of the enterprise business there and uh, his name is Bill Scannell. And now he's in charge of enterprise, what they call the commercial segment, which is inclusive of SMB and partners. So essentially they've consolidated the entire sales organization under one person and within one structure um, that he leads. Um, and so, um, you know, this sounds like the kind of thing that partners might be a little concerned about. Are there going to be changes in terms of who I'm working with? Is, uh, is there going to be disruption or confusion or anything? And so that the big message from him and everyone else from Dell, um, who was on this virtual kickoff event, basically was, you know, our attitude going in is, we are going to continue focusing uh, on, you know, keeping things simple, keeping things consistent. Um, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And we're not planning on, uh, on fixing anything. So don't be too worried um, about major disruption. If anything, though, you may see some things that were a little bit um, complicated for you get a little bit simpler now that these organizations are coming together. So you won't necessarily, um, depending on what kind of business you're in, need to maintain relationships with an enterprise account manager and a, a commercial or SMB account manager and a partner program manager. Maybe we can kind of pull that together for you so that there's really kind of one point of contact into the company uh, that you can deal with. And there are some other things that, that they're rolling out, none of which um, is, you know, huge, but all of which is designed to simplify the, the partner experience a little bit. So they're, they're simplifying their rebate structure, um, for example, and they had seven different categories before. Now it's going to be three fewer details to understand and, and keep track of. Um, they had multiple quoting tools before. If you were selling servers, you use this tool. If you were selling storage, you use that tool. They're pulling all that together. So it's one tool. Um, and, and a number of things like that. So nothing that is going to feel, I think, like major surgery, um, but a number of different things that they're hoping will make doing business with Dell, which after all is a very big company now, coming out of the merger with EMC. Uh, they are in pretty much every IT market that you can talk about, and um, they're just looking to make it easier to navigate the organization and all those different products um, through these sort of smaller incremental adjustments to the partner program. So if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's actually quite contrary to the last company that we just talked a little bit about, which was Microsoft, who frequently likes to break things just so they have something to fix. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> It's, Rob, is that true? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that. I've heard, I've heard. I've heard some scuttlebutt about that over the over the years. So I think uh, high probability, yeah, it probably is. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, Rich, there's uh, there's uh, nothing here that says uh, that partners should really be worried if 
if I'm reading what he's saying correct, that they're not going to go on and, you know, shake things up on a, at a big level, which I, I agree. I think for Dell at this moment in time wouldn't be a very good thing. But um, is he not doing enough? What, what do the partners want, Rich? Yeah, you know, that's a great question, actually. I mean, I, I, I think um, uh, for the mo- I, my kind of take on that, not having spoken to a ton of, of different Dell partners, is that they're probably grateful to hear um, that despite the fact there are these kind of leadership changes coming and there's some reorganization going on, that um, very little of what they deal with on a day-to-day basis is going to get shaken up um, too seriously on this. So, uh, you know, I'm sure they're happy to hear that quoting is going to get easier and it'll get easier to deal with rebates and um, their their training program is going to get some, uh, consolidated right now. You could co- um, collect credits in terms of certifications for VMware that maybe didn't really apply to other parts of the Dell business. So you, were, you, um, you might have one person who had to uh, study the same material twice in order to get, you know, uh, um, the certifications they were looking for, and they saw opportunities to uh, consolidate that and rationalize that, you know, that that's coming down the road to small things that make life easier, um, but nothing that's going to uh, to cause headaches, basically. And I, I suspect that's um, more than anything else what partners want. Now, Rob, put yourself in your position, in, or in their position, would you do something differently? Would you try to shake things up more, or... Or are you all about simplifying programs down in, in, a, in, in times of great success? You know, to me, it comes down to transparency and loyalty. The challenge when you grow to that scale, how do you maintain the integrity of the relationship with various partners at various levels? Um, without digging into it, you know, those are the things because, you know, as a business, in an industry like ours where it's so common to partner, I mean, the big companies partner down, the smaller companies partner up, and then, you know, there's tribal relationships and all sorts of stuff. But, but without the trust, then, you know, if there's trust, you can work through challenges. If there's not, those issues become bigger, you know, and and potentially sometimes terminal, but you know, at Dell size and scale, uh, what I'm hearing is the same thing I heard when we last partnered with them in 2006. So I appreciate the consistency. So, you know, it's, it's worth pointing out. It occurs to me that, um, uh, you know, we do our annual reader's choice awards, uh, at uh, channel pro, we go out to readers and we ask them to pick their favorites in a bunch of different categories, including partner program. Uh, and I can't remember uh, off the top of my head who won in 2019. I know Dell won in 2018, and I think they may have been second place in 2019. I'd have to go look that up. But I mean, they have been doing very well in that category for a number of years. And you go back far enough in time, and this was not true. I mean, the, the reputation right. Dell had in the channel was was kind of a poor one. And they have done a really good job, um, you know, in the last, let's call it half decade or so, of really kind of turning things around so that these days, they're, you know, their partner program is one of the most uh, popular ones in the industry. I, I don't know if, you know, what, because you, you work with, um, you know, your clients are, uh, are MSPs. And I, you know, I don't know if you kind of get that sense too, that um, generally speaking, there isn't enormous dissatisfaction um, with Dell these days that they, they seem to be doing okay. Yeah. You know, give credit where credit's due. They've definitely improved. I can certainly account for that. Um, the other thing I have to take in to consideration when you're, when you're hearing these things is there's two sides of every story, right? There's two folks who contribute to every interaction. And, and sometimes when you hear maybe less savory aspects of partnership, it it comes a little bit of a skewed perspective, right? So any one resource might have something at any given time, but in this instance, the fact that they're winning awards, that's coming from direct, feedback from a plethora of partners and that's worthy of respect. So. Very cool. All right. Well, Rich, I think that's kind of it for the news. Um, not that there was a, a, an abundance of a super exciting news this week, uh, <laughs> but it was, you know, it's something to go through. And I think it's all, always important, uh, especially for a partner like Dell, who many, many, many of you out there are partnered with to know that uh, things, things are hopefully going to stay the same, smoother, if not, get simpler as we go on. Uh, but we do have a bigger story that we want to talk about this week, and one that is a, a pretty cool topic 
which was, well, Dave Sobel wrote this. It's called Taking a Stand Against Digital Dystopia. Rich, tell us about this. Yeah, this is a column that appeared in the most uh, recent issue uh, of Channel Pro. Dave Sobel, for folks who don't know him, um, you know, has spent approximately half his career as an MSP. He spent approximately the other half working for a number of different vendors. Um, most recently, he was with uh, SolarWinds, uh, specifically SolarWinds MSP. Um, he is out in his own right now and doing a number of different things. Most interestingly, he's uh, podcasting a lot. Uh, and so he has a podcast called The Business of Tech. He has another one that he does with um, two other uh, people called uh, The Killing It Podcast. I, I love them both. Uh, so you might want to check those out. Uh, so he contributed this column to us. And it kind of brings together, um, you know, maybe two different strands uh, of the news that come up. Uh, in the media and specifically within uh, channel pro. So, I mean, we're all aware of the um, enormous concern and the growing concern about um, Facebook and Google and Twitter and some of their practices and um, the implication of those practices for data privacy, concerns about data privacy. Um, and that's kind of the, the digital dystopia that, uh, that Dave's talking about in this column. Um, and what really his larger point here is that all of us in IT really need to take a stand about that. And um, just in terms of doing the right thing, we really do need to um, draw certain lines in terms of what is or isn't appropriate conduct and make commitments and live by those commitments and, and really make respect for privacy and control over end user data a priority and a, and a value that we all embrace. But he also says, that, you know, by doing that these days, precisely because these issues are in the news a lot, and a lot of your customers are probably concerned about maybe Facebook knowing too much about them and, and how much do they know, precisely because there is this, all this conversation going on about these companies. To the extent that you make your respect for, um, for digital privacy and digital best practices part of your, your business and your pitch and something that you tell your customers about, Here, here's what we believe and here's what we do, this can actually be a source of competitive advantage um, for you right now. And it can make, it can be one more reason basically why um, end users potentially would want to do business with you is that you really um, firmly and deeply believe um, in protecting customer data and respecting uh, uh, customer rights and, and data privacy. And, you know, he, he provide, Dave provides a very concrete example of something that you can do. Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web, um, has created this code um, called, and let me get the name here from the column, Contract for the Web. We have a link to it um, in the article. You can search online and find it as well. And it, it spells out some rules of the road, some things that every responsible internet citizen really should be doing. Um, make the internet affordable and accessible to everyone. Respect and protect people's privacy and personal data. Um, develop technologies that support the best in humanity and challenge the worst. It's a whole series of rules like that. And, you know, anyone, an individual, a company, a government agency can sign on to the contract for the web. There are requirements in terms of proving that you're complying. But if you do that, you're not only doing something that's really right for, you know, the, the right thing to do for the internet and the right thing to do for the world, but it can also actually be the right thing to do uh, for your business. We could probably spend an hour on this topic. Rob, is it, is it indicative of the, of the weird world that we live in that, that a differentiator for your business can be touting ethical behavior? I'm going to say yes. And here's <laughs> why. <laughs> you laugh, I know. <laughs> we're, we're treading into dangerous water here, but let, let's look at the state of the world we live in right now. There's so much conflict and so much unclarity and so much just distortion that I think there's a real kind of void in things that are authentic and carry a high, high level of integrity. And this data privacy thing, because of the actions of the big four and, and even beyond, um, has become more top of mind. And there's generational deltas. Uh, you know, some of the millennials appreciate the targeted advertising because they see value in, Hey, I'm only seeing the ads that I want to see, but then you've got, you know, folks my age who are older than everybody on this call or whatever, but we value our privacy. Um, 
I don't want people in my business, right? It's like, this is my personal existence and, and I don't want to be marketed to. And this, this California thing with the California uh, Consumer Privacy Act or Consumer Protection Privacy Act, it's going to be inter interesting to see how that really shakes out because where are all these companies headquartered? Right here. So the litmus test around the efficiency and effectiveness of this, how data is harvested and handled. And it's going to be interesting to observe, especially when the first litigation hits and it's tested. So. The, you know, the thing about the contract for the web that I've always found interesting is that it puts a lot of onus on the, on the corporation to be ethical, but there's nowhere. It seems that the, there's any onus put on the individual to be responsible for how they distribute and disseminate and, and give out their data. Well, that's, that's a hundred percent valid point as well. I mean, we all, and again, accountability, accountability, you have to participate in your own rescue. So if you're out there and you're just like signing up for everything and you've got 500 apps on your device, all reporting back on you and you're hoarding apps and you're not even cognizant or aware of security, you know, there's a sense of, uh, of natural selection that's going to take place because if, if you're not personally responsible and taking action on your own behalf, how can you expect any other entity to care more about your data than you do? It's very true. And the amount of data people, people and businesses in general hand over to companies is kind of mind blowing, especially when it comes to things like these uh, digital assistants, Right. I mean, people, people stick Google, Google uh, uh, microphones in their homes, right. And cameras in their homes that, that record, you know, things that they say and report back and are connected to a company like Google. And when those services are free, right. You're not the, you're not the, uh, you're not the, the customer, right. You're the product. You're the product. Yeah. And, and I think, um, even, even while this contract for the web is very, I, I, a little bit more broad scaling to it. This is looking at a little bit more of a global perspective, especially with principles like, you know, keep all of the internet available all the time. I mean, China's never going to conform to that, nor any, many other countries like that. Um, you have to have an idealistic standard, right? We have to have a utopia that we're striving for and a, a ultimate outcome that, Hey, in the event that we could get there, this is what we want it to look like. And then just keep pushing. But is that now? Would you say that we are also in a position where, where while we can present these lofty goals and have companies sign on, is the days of ethical behavior over? Like, are we just going to say, "Oh yeah, that's what I'm totally doing"? That's not what I'm actually doing, you know. And I'm just going to go ahead and use that position of of, uh, of of power to say one thing and do another. Yeah. Um... There's been a theme that's kind of resurfaced a couple times on our, on our conversation today and really the, the good versus evil aspect, but you know, everything's going to be cyclical. The pendulum or pendulum, it's going to swing both ways. And, and, you know, just when you think, wow, we're really like going off the deep end, somehow it balances out again. Uh, not going to get all Zen or anything on it, but there, you know, there is a, a balance that's achieved and, I think that as consumer confidence and consumer tolerance of different things shows up, companies are realizing that they have to adapt to market demands. They have to adapt to the realities and there is ethical leaders out there and there are ethical companies, but you know, of course, then you've got others that are dumping chemicals in the ocean. So, you know, I don't know if, I don't believe in blanket statements, but I do believe that, that there are solid operators out there who will continue to set the example in a positive manner. Um, and hopefully those guys win. You know, Rob, this uh, um, column we're talking about here uses the expression digital dystopia. Um, dystopia is a pretty strong word. Um, so I mean, from a, from a security standpoint, um, and thinking more maybe in terms of businesses as opposed to consumers, how, how big an issue, how, how concerned should businesses and, and the channel pros who serve them be about the, um, the, the privacy risks um, associated with platforms like Google and Facebook and Twitter? Absolutely concerned. I'm still astonished 
I mean, I just had a call this morning with a client who told me they were moving their business email to Gmail. And I've never understood how a business can run on a free platform that basically the whole premise of how it's paid for is the harvesting that of that data. Because what most folks don't realize is if you exchange emails by proxy, you're accepting the terms of use. And so now I'm not even a user and I've just forfeited any data that I've exchanged with that person into an entity that I really don't want any exposure to. Right. So that's one example. The very actions that MSPs provide, and this, this has actually come up in a couple of stuff we've done together, Rich is, you know, clients won't want to take the necessary precautions and they won't want to take the protections or really enforce what they need to, to protect their own environment. So the MSP makes a concession. Okay, we won't use this one piece. Just for example, you know, saves the, the client a couple dollars. But the outcome of that concession is so much bigger than I think the MSPs really realize because as soon as they make that concession, all the responsibility moves from the client to the MSP because in the client's mind, they just got a better deal they don't really consider that they've now put themselves at risk by taking a key component of security out. The MSP is the one who knows better. And by conceding that basically said, okay, Mr. Client or Miss Client, you're going to have this much of a lower expense now, and we're going to have this much of a lower ability to defend you. And if it ever goes to litigation, what's the client's argument? I'm paying them for security. I'm paying them to protect us. And what's the MSP going to say? Well, they want to save a couple bucks. No one's going to remember that conversation at that point, And it's not going to be relevant. Right. So does that make any sense? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it kind of raises something else that I wanted to um, ask you about a little bit, which is, you know, cause you're talking about um, end users who are, uh, and we all know they are, they are a legion that who are unwilling to spend the money they need to, to secure themselves properly. There's a premise in Dave's piece here that um, in a lot of cases, if you present yourself to, to your customers as somebody who takes data privacy seriously, that's something that the customer will respect and appreciate. Um, but I wonder sometimes if customers worry enough about data privacy um, you know, to be appreciative of somebody who's serious about that. I'm, I'm just curious for your take on that. Um, I, I speak regularly with people who say um, that the concern level about security and privacy is way beyond, um, way higher than it's been pretty much ever in the past. And customers are coming to their IT partners and, and asking questions uh, about it. But I also continue to hear about a lot of customers who, in some cases, have no security defenses in place whatsoever um, and don't worry about it very much. I mean, do you have a take on... Um, the degree to which SMBs out there right now really are looking for partners who can, who, who will take privacy and security seriously um, and can demonstrate it in this way, like I'm a signatory to the contract for the web? So I'm going to make this one really simple. <laughs> I wish I had a bigger answer for you, but I, I have a personality flaw that I like to boil things down to the simplest common denominator. I'm just going to say that this very conversation is maybe one of the best filters of the quality of a, of a business relationship that an MSP and a client will ever have. Because if the alignment is there around this perspective, then the understanding of the risk is there and the ability to align and cooperate in doing what needs to be done to achieve each as desired level of outcome will be there. And that's, I think that, is going to be uniform up and down the spectrum, whether you're a, a privacy uh, a, a appreciator or privacy is just kind of, you know, you're one of those folks who's like, they got everything anyways. So does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Yep. It does. It does. It is. Um, so Rob, last question for you. <laughs> <laughs> last question for you. If as a, as a business owner, and one who is uh, who's thinking a lot about uh, data privacy in, in this day and age. How do you how do you not only explain this to to your clients, but also how do you practice this yourself? What what is like the first steps you should take as a business owner to 
adhere to this kind of ethical behavior that you can then therefore tout? You need to be clear in your terms, right? We under no circumstance ever share data. We have certifications of how our processes and everything protect the data. And we really have a even bigger, just a culture of clarity around, you know, like our number one core value is defend the client. So when my guys and gals come in to work every day, there's no uncertainty around why we're here. And so when your core values are clear and your actions align with your words, you know, I think that's how you live this. Um, otherwise, if it's not being talked about and it's not being presented even as a, 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 an awareness or, or anywhere, then, you know, the, the assumption is it's not being practiced. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's certainly a lot to think about. And it's, uh, it's a discussion that I think is going to become more and more prevalent as, as the value of data and the amount of data going into the digital realm uh, becomes more and more prevalent. <laughs> so massive. Um, Who would have imagined, you know, where we are these days? It's crazy. It, it is scary to think about for sure. And, and, and like we said at the beginning, there's, there's a responsibility from, customer, from companies, but there's also a responsibility from individuals that we're not. And that side of the discussion, I don't think we're having yet. And I think that side of the discussion is due. But we are going to have to save that discussion for another day because we, we are going to move on and to, to talk more about security-related things. But uh, we have a great interview coming up here with Kyle Hensloven from Huntress Labs. Uh, we're going to talk about the threat activities against MSPs and what, uh, what they're doing to counter them, and also a little bit about the story we talked about last week, how they kind of brought down a, um, <clears throat> a nefarious uh, individual on the dark web uh, selling an MSP's credentials. Really cool stuff. So stick around for that. We will be right back. Hey, and we are back with part two of Channel Pro Weekly, and we have a special guest interview today. So we all know there's a lot, uh, we've been talking a lot about the show about the kind of rising threat activities against managed service providers and uh, hackers and those nefarious folks that we talk about targeting MSPs to get through to a larger base of clients. Uh, and we want to know what the industry is doing to counter those nefarious people. So here to talk about that is the CEO of security vendor Huntress Labs, Kyle Hensloven. Kyle, welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Matt. Obviously, a uh, fun topic for today, that's for sure. It sure is. It's one we've been talking about a lot lately because, uh, as we know, there has been a, a, a much greater uh, emphasis on, on hackers targeting MSPs specifically because they are kind of the... The, the ones that hold the keys to the kingdom. And once you can break down their castle gate, uh, you can plunder and pillage those on the inside. Um, so uh, there's a lot to talk about here, but first, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and Huntress Labs and what you guys do and who you are? Yeah, so I, I cut my teeth in the intelligence community, U.S. intel community at NSA. Uh, so offensive side of cybersecurity instead of defense. Uh, actually won the world series of, of hacking at defcon's capture the flag so I, i've got some tech chops underneath me uh but really this has kind of led me into a company to say hey can i use my offensive skills to secure you know the small and medium businesses that are usually overlooked so that's kind of what huntress is about now how long were you with uh, with the nsa doing doing that kind of stuff uh, so as an actual like employee, both military and contractor, a, a little over a decade. And then uh, as a National Guard member, I still up till February of 2019 was still doing, you know, one week in a month, two weeks a year uh, of operations. Now, is that the CIA or the NSA where they give you a license to kill? Ooh, um, I get the license to kill bits. Um, I, I, they, they don't let me anywhere near people. Well, that's well, that's probably a good thing uh, for a for a technologically savvy person like yourself. Um, so, uh, and you said you did that. You said you were that for a decade. Tell us a little bit about your experience in um, what, like winning the capture of the flag and uh, part of the things that you would maybe do in in your role there. So what a lot of people don't realize when you get to that level of like kind of top of the world level where you're actually competing usually with other people and other intelligence apparatuses is usually how it works. Uh, the game is how do you initially exploit? So you're actually creating zero days. Uh, but the actual to win the game, it's all about how do you maintain access? How do you continue, uh, continue to pillage data? And can you do it the most to the most people the longest and uh, 72 hours straight? 
you, you know, the teams that actually play competitively don't sleep and that's what it takes to win. Wow. Amazing. So now you took all of the chops that you learned and you created Huntress Labs. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Though it was, you know, ironically, I was the shady hacker on one end and we <laughs> created a product to go chase people like us. It, it was really about raising the bar. I, I'm a firm believer that you're, you're never going to stop somebody from getting in, but, uh, I'm a salty guy, to be honest. And the idea of just uh, allowing somebody to come in and say, hey, we're not going to challenge them, that's, that, that doesn't go over very well. So using my skills to at least uh, make sure you got to earn your access, right? The, the bar is this high if you're going to come in. <laughs> and for those who may not be familiar with Huntress and what you do, can you explain a little bit more about what, what you do at Huntress? Yeah. So it's a, it's a lightweight product sits on each one of your endpoints and it, it finds the breaches that slip past or the incidents that slip past your preventative layers, whether it's firewall, antivirus, and we're specifically looking at the long-term mechanisms people like me use to maintain access. But how do we find them quick when it's still an incident before it escalates to a breach? So even though it's all techies, you know, all about security, it's really about the business problem, which is, you know, when you have an incident, let's make it a commodity, get it the heck out of there before it escalates. So Kyle, the, um, the specific context for you coming on the, the show today, on the previous episode uh, of the podcast, we actually spoke at some length about a, a specific incident. So like Matt said, there are a lot of MSPs under attack right now, um, a lot of uh, bad guys basically looking to penetrate MSP accounts, but you were very closely associated um, with this one particular incident um, in which uh, somebody went on the dark web and offered to sell uh, credentials belonging to an MSP for $600. And um, the story itself is absolutely fascinating. It's also kind of an illustration of a larger phenomenon. And um, frankly, the, to explain how it kind of came about, I think folks in the audience first need to know a little bit about this organization, the Managed Services Provider um, Inf Information Sharing and Analysis Center um, that you and the folks at Datto set up last summer. So talk a little bit about that organization, what it is, what it does, and why you guys set it up. So you can imagine, you know, the, the backdrop on this is 2019 kicked off with more ransomware targeting MSPs and, and actually using their own admin tools, RMM capabilities to deploy ransomware. And so Datto and I had, you know, the team there, I think it was the CISO, Ryan Weeks, we'd met up informally right about the, the DattoCon timeframe. And he, he candidly said, like, this is getting bad. We should probably do something to collaborate better. And that's how informal everything started. If we jumped together on a Slack channel, it was just my team, his team, we all had met, shared niceties and said, when an incident happens, let's use this as our communication forum. And that little tiny idea started growing into a handful of other vendors. Now it's, you know, roughly 40, 50 of us between vendors, some MSP members that are security savvy but it's really informal. It's, it's a Slack channel for heaven's sake. So I don't want to make it sound too, uh, you know, too rigorous, but it really was created just to get stuff done, right. To, to get things done. And I know there's a lot of formalities that usually come in information sharing. Uh, but the real idea behind this was if we see something nasty, can we help collaborate? Can one vendor give another vendor an idea? And a lot of times it's actually one MSP finds something that affected them. And that turns out if you spread it with the community and educate, uh, you might be able to protect, you know, tens or hundreds of MSPs. So uh, th that's how it all got started back in, you know, I guess, June to August of 2019. And I mean, I, I've heard you say in, in other venues before, from your perspective, this is how we even the odds with the attackers. This is how we beat them. It's only by pooling information and collaborating. If, if knowledge of specific compromises and attacks is sitting in all these different silos out there, people aren't sharing information about what's going on and how to um, uh, counter it. Uh, basically, we're all more vulnerable to those attackers. Yeah, and I, I got teenage kids and I had to explain this to them the other day and I was like, listen, uh, the hackers themselves chat, they, they talk, they text, they have their dark web forums how come defense isn't doing the same? My kids were like, oh, you know, so you, uh, you know, you just make TikTok videos and send them. I'm like, no, that's not how it works, kids. We're not making silly <laughs> YouTube videos. We're, we're actually working together. And I don't know if they believe me or not, but the idea is the same. If they're going to collaborate against us, why don't we collaborate against them? So um, this organization comes into being a, initially, it's two members, it sort of slowly grows from there, but that's June, July last year. So let's fast forward now into, uh, I guess, very late September, early October, um, when the folks at Datto reach out to you about this particular um, incident that they detected. Tell folks what, uh, 
what was found out there and then what you did from that point forward. So uh, one of the researchers at Datto said, look, um, we were, we were going against hackers that we knew they were using Tor. And they said, one of the ideas we had was let's start monitoring the scraping the dark web. And one of the things that they came up with, you know, very, very end of uh, September, it literally might've been the last day of September said, look, here's somebody blatantly saying they've hacked an MSP. They're selling access. And of all things, they said, you know, they had 20 customers. They called out a law firm. They called out a handful of others, maybe a pharmaceutical company and the whopping 600 bucks. And we're like, is that really, that's the going rate, 600 bucks. Wow. Um, and so we marinated on that for, you know, a day or so kind of thinking like, what do we do? Obviously get law enforcement. What can we do to give back? But the real fun started when we started collaborating. And I think what started out as a joke of like, wouldn't it be nice, you know, if, if we could do something, you know, we knew we couldn't hack back, you know, us law doesn't allow that. But there was some gray area of could you social engineer the social engineers themselves? And so that's how it started. We, uh, you know, the team at Huntress got together. We came out with the persona. We made sure we baked an account because some of these accounts, they have to be active long enough to be able to participate in certain of these dark web forums. And so we did. We put together a persona and we, we social engineered the hacker till they gave us what we needed to know, which was uh, a screenshot of the MSP that they had compromised. And the long story short is we took that information, did some research on the, uh, you know, the, the open source uh, platform of the internet, Googling, and uh, ended up discovering both the MSP, uh, some of the victim clients, and uh, brought it to the attention of the FBI. Now, on the FBI piece of that, so this is um, a, a new development in the case that first came to light this week, um, courtesy of, uh, of the folks at CRN. Um, so initially it looked like, I mean, certainly if you look at the Torum post and, and the advertisement, the classified ad, essentially putting this MSP on sale, it looked like somebody from outside had compromised, um, you know, and in fact, they said, the attacker said it was a phishing thing yeah. and we got in that way. And that's how we, we, um, worked our way into this MSP and got their data. But what we learned this week is that somebody has actually been arrested by the FBI and it was somebody who used to work for or does work for this MSP. I mean, can you tell us any more about that piece of the story? Yeah. So on our end, you could imagine for any investigation, whether it's intelligence community or law enforcement, once it starts, uh, it generally silos, right? They're, they're going to protect everything that's going on. Not a whole lot of information comes out. Uh, so we did in the Baltimore office, we shared some information. We've actually learned another security firm about the same time shared uh, some information with the Cleveland office. So multiple security researchers, independent, uh, working with the FBI. And the long story short, because of this person kept giving out information, it became pretty clear that the victims were all in the Atlanta region, you know, uh, whether it was Southern Georgia, middle Georgia, but around that area. Um, and then I got a call after we finally, we put, you know, roughly a 90 day embargo to make sure after we notified that MSP, we had to collaborate. Yeah. Believe it or not, once we figured out the MSP, we actually uh, tried to notify and you can imagine the answer is, <laughs> is this a scam? Is, is this real? And we, we ended up using ConnectWise. The CISO at the time of ConnectWise was the one who actually partnered with us to tell that story in the MSI sack. Uh, but the long story about law enforcement was, um, they, they continued moving with this, uh, this hint and with the other, like I mentioned, the information given to the Cleveland office as well. Uh, they went all the way to the point of a sting. They got them to actually buy the credentials. They discovered that according to the arrest, uh, warrants and the affidavits, uh, it's pretty crystal clear that this, uh, gentleman, uh, Mr. Britt, as they, they, they accuse, uh, was this gentleman that worked at the MSP was kind of a disgruntled employee, was laid off. Uh, I think it says terminated is the exact word that was used and then started selling his own account uh, using his own name uh, that was, you know, uh, used for this administration panel. So he sold his own credentials. So that uh, some of the conversation about getting fished, it seemed believable. It seemed credible talking to the hacker, but you know, sometimes things aren't exactly what they look like. So that was, that was a wild turn of events. You know, so like I said before, this is a, a really interesting story in its own right. Um, but I mean, what makes it significant is th this is one little drop in the ocean, right? I mean, um, and we've spoken just within the last week about other similar um, situations you've come across where an MSP's data has been put for sale on the dark web. So this, this is happening all the time, all over the place. Hackers are trying to work, in, uh, work their way into MSP systems. Um, and succeeding more often than any of us would like. So I, as you look at this particular incident and maybe some other incidents that you're aware of, what, what are the larger lessons for MSPs in our audience right now in terms of 
where they're most vulnerable, what they most need to be doing to protect themselves from these kinds of threats. You know, if you would have asked me that 10 days ago, I would have given you a much different answer than today. Uh, you know, I was at NSA when Edward Snowden had the insider uh, threat at, at, at the uh, agency. And I would have told you, you know, insider threats, it's really that. Um, but what we learned about this one MSP situation clearly was insider. And what more of that information from the public records of the arrest shows that he not only did it at this MSP, he later went to a tax firm and did it to them as well, dumped their information and also was selling that on the dark web, which we saw the same handle selling access to tax data. We just didn't realize this could have been a serial insider event. So, um, 10 days ago, I would have told you insider threats are something you absolutely need to consider. You should use least privilege, all the typical recommendations. Um, we've seen some pretty damaging results now. Um, two cases that we've worked separate of this uh, situation where it was immediately assumed it was someone on the outside, but it turns out it was some employees that you know were in a bit of a financial bind. And some of them were just literally using their access with the remote administration tools to extort the clients of the MSP. And this is something that we now have multiple screenshots from multiple different names. Uh, even some people saying like, oh, if you want access to my, uh, my, my own employer, it's going to cost you three Bitcoin instead of one, LOL. And that, that's, that's the transcript. So as someone who's seen a lot of bank heist movies, like there's always an inside man. I, I, but if, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I would have just, I mean, on my end, right. My job was offense. It was remote. You always think of, you know, Robert and I get together at a lot of these and we joke about, uh, Oh, it's the guy or gal that's in their basement, right. From overseas. But, uh, yeah, sometimes the insider is the one that you could look at these elaborate ways that maybe somebody hacked their way in and got past two factor, or maybe it's just the threat in front of you. Yeah. Rob, have you, have you seen a lot of security incidents like this where there's like an inside, inside person, disgruntled employee kind of thing? Not at this scale. <laughs> I think the, uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time talking with MSPs for the last year and a half. And I think that's where I've built a relationship with Kyle. And if I get an opportunity, I'll share a Kyle story at some point, but you know, what we see in talking with a lot of these folks is they don't, consider all the consequences to all their actions. You know, there'll be a standardized admin password that's shared across every tech at an MSP. There'll be, you know, common nomenclatures. There'll just be things that, you know, for someone like Kyle, who, you know, this has been so informative for me, I'm piecing it all together. I'm like, all right, I get it. Why well, I get this guy, right? Cause he's coming from the offensive side. And I grew up on the defensive side. My clients were, DOD, Fortune 500 cities, all the way down to small clients. So I've been literally on the other side of the ball the whole time. I'm, it's this is interesting, but but these guys put these things together, and then not only do they use lack of best practice, even in how they manage credentials and authentication and access, but they'll have the same person doing help desk as doing security, and that individual ends up having opposing outcomes. They can't win because when they're trying to play their help desk or support role, their job is to take away the pain, to make it work, to help get the client back to work. Whereas the security side is going to be like, well, do we really need to open this up? They're going to be more diligent before they just whitelist. And so when you look at the landscape and consider what's really going on out there, so many of these folks, you know, Finance is always part of the equation and the MSPs are literally stumbling at the same point the clients are with the rising cost of defense. Now, you know, it's coming down. There's a lot of great services like Huntress that make the visibility aspect, the threat hunting more reasonable. But when you look at the cost of truly putting a stack together, they're still cutting themselves short and not, fully embracing what it truly requires to defend an environment. So does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, you know, I, I want to kind of bring a, so this is a, a case we're talking about here where it was an insider. It was an inside job um, basically, but there have been um, stories in the news very recently, um, you know, over the course of the last year or two about vulnerabilities in some of the systems that MSPs rely on to do business every day. Um, and so I'll, I'll toss this out to, to both of you, uh, you guys. How, 
How big an issue, how big a, a danger is that, the, the possibility that these systems aren't as hardened um, as they need to be? And how concerned should an MSP be about um, you know, the RMM and the PSA tools and remote access tools that they're using right now? I'll, I'll kick things off there, Rich, with just a, a simple, I'm coming from a place of privilege. What I mean by that is Huntress is four and a half years old, which means everything that we've built is on a modern stack and has all kinds of great security mechanisms in. I think it's so easy sometimes to just immediately jump to the, yeah, there's, there's a lot of vulnerabilities and a lot of risk in some of the vendor products out there. But remember, that might have 20 years of debt that has to be modernized. Uh, and it's not necessarily like, oh, somebody's better or somebody's worse. It was just built at a different time. Uh, so I think some of that debt is, is having to be paid now. Um, in one week, we at our company, we do nothing in regards to like actual vulnerability to discover. Even though we, we have a bunch of offensive talent, we, we spend our time focused on defense. Uh, but in one week, we got to a chance to team up with three different vulnerabilities that the community brought to us to be able to validate. Um, some of them were in remote administration tools. Some of them were in the two-factor system. And uh, I think as those became public in the news, all within about a one-week series, I think there was eight total vulnerabilities, some very small, some very critical. But uh, the overall idea is we've got a lot of debt that we're sitting on top of that I think that's something that us as a community, whether vendors or, uh, you know, MSP members, or even the small businesses that we're supporting, uh, we're going to have to pay that piper. Hey, Rod, how concerned are you about, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the weaknesses potentially hidden in the tools that you uh, rely on to support your customers? Well, it's a huge concern. You know, I'm very familiar with one of the, vulnerabilities that Kyle and his team kind of brought to the community around, you know, really what's a, a predominant and ridiculously powerful remote access tool for, you know, MSP and administrators. And if you take a step back and you look at this thing holistically, all the attention that's coming here, the vendors are, are starting to take it more seriously. They're starting to say, wow, we really, you know, there was a, an integration between two of the big gorillas in the channel a couple of years ago that got a lot of attention. And that was kind of the first one where I think a lot of folks are like, Hey, we really better stop and, and pay attention. So while the vendors have moved towards doing a better job of patching and securing their environments, a lot of MSPs have not stayed in step in applying the patches. So the very, aspect of the value add that they bring to the community. They're not always, you know, exercising the own, their own, uh, you know, memory muscles at home, if you will, by, by applying the same principles. So it's a huge concern. Um, Kyle, I, I want to circle back to the ISAC uh, that you played a, a part in, in creating six some months ago. Um, it, it's interesting. You mentioned you've got 40 or 50 members of that. We spoke about it, um, I want to say, eight days ago, and it was 30. So, I mean, it's clearly growing, um, and it's, you know, it's been in the news. That's, that's got to be part of it. What, what lies ahead? It's been a very informal um, thing up until this point as you kind of look down the road. What, what comes next for that organization? What are your hopes or aspirations for it? Now, I'm going to get totally lame and cliche here for one second, uh, but with great power comes a little bit of uh, great responsibility. For instance, um, we were working directly with a hacker and who knows, maybe we could have actually upset an FBI investigation that was going on better. So we're even learning a little bit on not, not only do, how do we scale the community? How do we enable people, but also how do we handle these situations? Like none of us are police. We're not law enforcement. We're not doing investigations, but we should probably know how to cooperate with them. But you could imagine before this, this is arrest number one. You know, I've, last year alone, I think Huntress dealt with something like 60,000 incidents reported. But this is incident number one that we're aware of where somebody actually got arrested on the other end. So uh, I, I think it would be real easy to say all the obvious things. The team is growing. We're going to start formalizing, going to get some bylaws in place, going to make sure we start figuring out how to vet the community and how to collaborate most efficiently. All those things are just part of the storming and norming. Uh, but in the back of my head, as I start thinking about scaling is let's make sure we don't shoot ourselves in the foot by trying to do something good. Right. Yeah. The justice league. I think about that, right. They, they do everything they can to protect uh, good from evil, 
but it, it, if I remember some of those earlier comics, it seems like the police were always pretty salty at the superheroes too. Uh, I want to make sure that doesn't happen with MSP ISAC. Yeah, you know, um, when we were talking last week about this story and with you taking such a direct involvement in trying to bring down some someone who was uh, participating in nefarious activities, do you think that now that this has hit the news and um, we've kind of seen how you how you did it and how you got them to uh, relinquish the screenshots so you can kind of figure out who it was. Does that give, give hackers warning now? And would you think they're going to be more looking for that in, down the road? So we have uh, in that same forum that we, uh, you know, we social engineered Wozniak. Um, the first post is look what Huntress Labs did inside the Torum forum. You know, <laughs> this is BS. So they're aware. Uh, the very second one came out with oh my gosh, Wozniak's arrested. So the current conversation in that, in that forum right now is, do we start charging for people to come in? Do we create a bar? Do we make somebody do something illegal to have less likely security researchers? They're not going to do illegal stuff like us. Uh, at the same time, other people are like, look, if the feds are involved, they're going to have their, you know, get out of jail free card and they're going to do it. So we know firsthand that there's two things on there that, uh, they're aware of what we're doing. The cat and mouse game is playing. Uh, what's cool about it is beforehand, we were kind of playing checkers, right? A real basic game. Uh, but it's awesome to go in there and see the whole community. Like, is any of this safe? How do I know you're not a fed? Is this, is this forum ran by the feds? I like that, that now we're playing chess. Yeah. And what do you think the reaction of the hacker community is going to be now that, uh, now that they know they're playing the game? Some of them are trying to go inwards. They're already talking about, is there better forums, more private things? Um, you know, the reality is I'm aware of researchers in almost all the popular forums. So uh, I think this is the first shot across the, the, the bow though, that says like, Ooh, all right, we're, we're going head to head. And what's cool is notice Robert was really kind and said, look, you know, uh, Kyle and I see these from different perspectives. He was doing offense, doing defense. And I always think about forever and ever there was this, look, uh, defense only has to mess up once, you know, offense has, you know, or our defense has to be accurate always. The offense only has to be right once. But what's cool is people like Robert have been able to step up in the same situation and say, look, this person was the act. They only had to slip up one time and they ended up in handcuffs. If you think about, if you've read the actual affidavit, not only did uh, Britt use his own email address that he was selling, in his password that the FBI got a hold of, his last four of his social was used in there. On top of it, where he received his crypto coin was registered to his own license, driver's license and address. So it only takes them slipping up one time too. There's no reason that we on defense can't play by the same exact rules that offense has been playing against us forever. So it also kind of sounds like maybe this particular hacker was um, not the the brightest hacker in the box the opsec was not strong with this one uh. <laughs> well, that's actually an interesting point right because if you if you break down the profile of this individual you know without even knowing them when i hear things like disgruntled and then making the very simple mistakes you you've got an operator who has way too much emotional involvement to be practical and effective. And, you know, that's just like B league stuff. So that's interesting. So Kyle, for anyone who is listening now, they want to know more about the ISAC. They're maybe thinking, you know, I, I'd like to be a, a part of that. I'd like to see what they're talking about, see if I can contribute. Um, I, I know that um, Ryan Weeks over at Data really kind of feels like the initial priority needs to be on rallying the vendor community before it, you, you kind of open it up in a serious way to, uh, to MSPs. But, you know, for somebody in the audience who is an MSP, who's curious to know, can they, how would they go about being a part of that? What, what would you say? Right now, I mean, this is where I would love to plug, like, here's the perfect landing page. As silly as it sounds, right now, good old fashioned Kyle at Huntress.com uh, is a perfect way to start this. And the reason for it is we're building a queue. We're figuring out what the priorities are. Uh, I can think of plenty of cases where I went fishing and I invited one too many people on my boat and it turned out to be a pretty darn bad experience. I think the same exact case, if we scale too quick, it could fall apart. But uh, when, when things are stable, the idea is to just open the floodgates. Uh, there's also other communities, like for instance, uh, the TSP ISAO that ConnectWise has. There's no reason that you can't participate in multiple and it's not a you're in this or you're in that. I think uh, what you really have to figure out is, 
am I with the community or am I going to watch? And I think our challenge right now is if you, if you're with the community, reach out. Well, very cool. And I think uh, we're probably out of time. So that's a good spot to end it. Uh, Kyle, thank you so much for joining us here on Channel Pro Weekly. So we can talk to you about, uh, about that, that incredible story. Uh, bringing, I'm always about bringing down bad people. So uh, great job on that. And for sharing some of your insights uh, in, in the current state of hackers and, um, and uh, security. So I really appreciate that. Yeah, thanks so much uh, for having me. This is a great time. So folks, that's uh, Kyle Hansloven, CEO of Huntress Labs. You can find them at HuntressLabs.com. We are going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to wrap up the show with some of our regular uh, features. We have a museum pick and a tick pick for you, and Rich will break down what has been and what will be. Stick around for that. We will be right back. And we are back with part three of Channel 4 Weekly. So um, before we move on, I want to say what, a, what an awesome interview with Kyle uh, that was. He, super, super smart. Really cool story about um, how that. And I, I kind of wonder as we move forward how the private sector is going to be more involved in the, uh, the taking down and investigation side of, uh, of, of digital criminals. I don't know. What do you think, guys? Yeah, you know, it's it's actually an area that um, I wish we had uh, had time to get into a little bit more because I, I interviewed Kyle about a week ago and he brought that up. He brought it up again um, today. And I mean, it, clearly there are concerns and, and issues and nuances in his mind about, you know, when do you reach out to law enforcement? How do you reach out and work with them? And um, I really would be interested to, to hear more of his uh, thinking about that because um, it's just one of, of you know, many um, complexities that an organization like this ISAC has to, to think through. He was talking about another one, which is just, you know, information sharing is a great thing in theory, but if you share information with a member of the group who then goes out and takes vigilante action, um, information sharing is not a great thing. And so how do you kind of regulate who knows what and um, what, it, what is an appropriate use of the information being sh um, shared? It's there are a lot of interesting questions um, they're going to need to kind of think about. Unethical behavior. We've talked about that a lot today, it seems. Rob, what did you, what did you think of that interview? Now, you've known Kyle a while, so what, what did you think? Yeah, I thought it was great. Um, you know, I, I know Kyle and I know Ryan Weeks with Data, both very, you know, solid individuals with, with a higher purpose in, you know, wanting to get this knowledge out and have the collaboration. Um, I think my first thought was not being so aware of this that we're going to throw our hat in the ring. I'll be on the, I'll be on the horn with Kyle after this, but, but the reality is there's so many players coming into our space, right. Who are there for varying reasons and, and such, but the communication and the community tying together, it can only make us stronger. And uh, when you see the ransoms doing what they're doing and the, 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 the escalation of the average ransom, I think the latest report from Coveware is like over $84,000 is the average ransomware. So it, it's time. The time is right for this. And the more that participate, the better. But to Kyle's point, how do you keep that community from being infiltrated uh, for adverse reasons? So it's me watching fun to watch it shake out much in the same much in the same way he was talking about how they're infiltrating their community right that that door swings both directions so yeah, i think both indeed. sides are going to be extra cautious absolutely all right well we uh we are going to move on so um as um, listeners who uh who have been with us here for a little while know that uh on occasion, we like to play a little game we call Five Questions, where Rich and I kind of fire off five sometimes really ridiculous questions at our guests just to kind of <laughs> see what they say and <laughs> get a rise out of them or learn a little bit more about them. Uh, and so Mr. Rob has uh, agreed to join us with, uh, with that game today and be our, be our victim, if you will. Rob, I will, I will start it off. We, we were talking a little bit about coffee earlier. So if you were forced to drink one specific type of coffee, for the rest of your life, what would it be? So when I was in the Philippines, there was this little coffee shop off of Greenbelt and they had this Blue Mountain number two, which at 12 bucks a cup was ridiculous to me, but oh my God, it was the absolute best coffee I've ever had in my life. And I, that was my daily stop. So 
that, that wow a twelve dollar a cup of coffee it, that's like uh po- beyond starbucks level there yeah no it was this fancy percolator with bulbs and drop the water through over the over the the ground and it, it but yeah that stuff was incredible well if you're gonna narrow it down to one for the rest of your life you better do it right and it sounds like you would on that one um rich you want to take the next question yeah, yeah. So you're in uh, San Francisco, Rob, but uh, 10, 11 days from now, I'm going to be there too for the uh, RSA conference, the security conference, and I'll be running around from one vendor meeting to the other. But let's just say I carved out a little free time and I didn't want to do what all the tourists are doing there. Like, what, what is the cool thing to do in San Francisco that the locals know about, but maybe other people don't? Right. So first off, Stay away from Pier 39. There's nothing of interest over there. Uh, total tourists. That's where the folks who come to the city, it's always like they didn't prepare for the cold in the summer. So you see the I Heart SF fleece everywhere. The places that I would go would be Golden Gate Park to the uh, Academy of Science. The place is amazing. They've got a giant fish tank and all sorts of like a, a ray, uh, rooftop um it, the, the building self-sustaining i mean it's just incredible so definitely the academy of science and then the other thing is you know a lot of folks don't know this but sf presidio which is an old army base from world war ii which has now been mostly restored back to the original uh like you know the marsh and everything over there but it's the only self-sustaining national park in the country and, and they've done such an amazing job out there with with uh, restoring the old military housing and turning it into to real housing, you know, that is rented out to residents in the city. Um, Chrissy Field, that whole area, it's, it's worth a walk. And there's some incredible views of Golden Gate. So, you know, it'll be a nice break from the activity of RSA, let's just say so. And, uh, and outdoor activities. I like it. Thanks. Yep. Very good. Question three. What was the first thing you stuck into a USB port? <laughs> The first thing into a USB port, like ever, ever, probably. I mean, you can remember. <laughs> honestly, I can't remember. I'm sure it's a printer. It had to be a printer. The <laughs> <laughs> USB printer. All right, I like it. Uh, I will do. Well, Rich, go ahead. Take question four. Uh, in- inevitably, I always get a food question in my mind. Just wanders to food. Maybe it's because we tend to record midday and lunch is coming up. Right. But- you uh, you can't have both. You have to choose one or the other, you know, to eat for the rest of your life, basically. Exactly. Is it sandwiches or pizza? Ooh. That's actually an easy one. I'd say sandwiches, hands down. He says sandwiches. Yeah. Now, if you had posed Mediterranean in there somewhere, ah. Mediterranean all day. But, yeah, definitely sandwiches and those two. All right, and am I? And uh, oddly enough, I will I will follow up with this question on a sandwich: <laughs> uh, Miracle Whip or mayonnaise? Neither stuff will kill you. <laughs> <laughs> so, then, so then, what is your condiment uh, of choice? Either like uh, spicy mustard or just lettuce, tomato, pepperoni, black pepper, and Tabasco. There you go. Ooh, a spicy guy. I like it. I like it. I'm going to ask you what your favorite hot <laughs> <clears throat> Very cool. All right. Well, thank you uh, so much for playing five questions. Yeah, great to be here. You guys have been awesome. Thank you. Uh, appreciate that. All right. We are going to move on. So, uh, Rob, you, you, this is your first time on with us. Um, for yeah. those, this might be new to you, but for those who uh, have been with us a while, they know that I have a massive collection of old technology. Um, I call it a collecting it a hobby my wife calls it a disease but but either way you all win because you guys get to see all this really old cool old stuff that i've kind of collected over the years and can kind of show you what technology was like back in the day now are you are you like a tech guy do you collect a lot of stuff um got any old to, things laying around i try to stay pretty spartan but if, if, if i'm honest uh you know my first job was installing UHF, VHF antennas on 50 foot towers. So, you know, just, we go back I'm with you. So let's, let's, let's see what we got. Fantastic. Well, I, uh, I, we were at 134 episodes in, we started at episode seven. So I've still got, <laughs> I've still got quite a, quite a bit left to go. And Rich has seen, seen this in person. He can attest. It's pretty sad. 
Yeah, you're building this up pretty good. I'm getting a little concerned about what's about to uh, emerge. <laughs> no, so. nothing, nothing, nothing. I'm just trying to <laughs> trying to help people understand. So, um, I, I have a, a display cabinet uh, that I have a lot of old cell phones. Oh, okay. so, uh, so, and I have a lot of IT stuff too. Sometimes I, I pick a phone. I, I wanted to pick a phone this week specifically because um, there's a new one out that I think is worth talking about uh, because it definitely finds us cross section between old and new. So, my museum pick this week is going to be the Motorola Razor. <laughs> now, Rob, you ever had, do you ever have one of these? I, was like, I, I am a former uh, Razor user, very familiar with that phone. Yeah, this thing took the world by storm uh, back in the day. Now, now Motorola had a couple of big hits. Uh, they had their Teletac, which was a huge hit. They had their StarTac, which was also a huge hit. Then they kind of got thrown to the wayside. And then the Razor came out. And man, they were on top of the world mm -hmm. for years. And for, well, I don't want to say for years, for a good couple of years with the Razor. But of course, they sat on it, and they're like, "Oh, we've we've perfected cell phones. <laughs> yep. No need to do anything else." And then, of course, like they all came along. Other companies came along and ate their lunch. But the Razor was a very, very interesting uh, and and uh, technology technologically advanced phone at the time. Very thin, folded up, very compact. This is when phones, small phones, were definitely kind of in. Uh, it was available on uh, every major network you could possibly imagine. Came in a variety of colors. This is obviously the champagne gold. <laughs> Ooh, fancy schmancy. Um, so now, Rich, you've, you've had a variety of phones in the past. Did you ever have a Razor? I didn't. I remember coveting a Razor. I remember thinking that's a cool looking phone, but I never uh, owned one. Yeah, I, um, I actually never used the Razor personally. Uh, this one actually belonged to my wife. Who had this one? I was I was uh, on the cutting edge back then, toting around a Windows Mobile phone. Uh, hmm. If you remember those, like Windows Mobile PDA kind of phones, um, I had one of those. I was very happy with it. By the way, those were pretty big, weren't they? They were kind of clunky. Some of them were, yeah. I, they tried to slim them down, like because when the Treo came out, they had like the uh, like the blackjack and a couple of those yeah. slim down where it, it wasn't actually a touch screen. It was like a wheel kind of thing. Yeah. But I had like the stylus, man. I was like, I got my stylus. I can do web browsing in that awful web mobile web browser. And I could like, I was on top of the world, man. But it was a great PDA. It was good for doing the things that I needed to do. Uh, but this was definitely the height of fashion then. So the reason why I wanted to talk about this as my museum pick is because Motorola has recently released a new Razer phone. Rich, oh. have you seen this thing? I, I ha it's funny, actually, that um, we're talking about the Razor this this week because um, I mentioned the uh, SMB forum events that we do. And one of the distinctive little qualities of those events is that um, in our show guide, you got a show guide in any event you go to, but in our show guide, in addition to the agenda and the speaker bios and so on, we we incorporate all sorts of great white papers. And I was writing a white paper this week about hardware trends, and the Razor actually comes up in that. Um, so yeah, uh, this this has been in, in, on my mind recently too. Yeah, so uh, so Rob and Rich, that's gonna be my tech pick this week, the new Motorola Razor. So what they've essentially done, and I'm putting it up on the screen there for, for those who are watching, um, they've essentially taken the exact form factor of the Razor down to the little notch that made it the same size, and they turn and they've, but instead of having the inside be buttons and the small screen at the top like it formerly was, now it is a foldable. OLED screen. So it's basically a full Android uh, touchscreen device, but the screen actually folds. Rob, That's have you seen idea. anything like that before? I mean, the, the fact that you're folding glass or something that at least feels like glass is just incredible. So, wow, that, that's a hot looking phone. It is. It is, and I and I, I was just so shocked that like of all like uh, all of the different ways they could do it. And uh, Samsung has like their Galaxy Z Fold that they kind of released to try to serve as the same market. But I love that Motorola recognized that they they kind of had the form factor right a long time ago with the with with this kind of part that stuck up and then it folded flat in. But they just needed to change the inside of it to be a full touchscreen, you know, color display. Uh, running a modern OS. It's, it's, it's awesome. What a great mix of then and now. Um, now, the, now, the internals of the phone are not as fast as some of the other devices that uh, you might see out there in the smartphone market. Not as much RAM, not as much storage, certainly not as fast. But I believe Motorola is onto something in the style 
category, which has been kind of lacking in phones for a while. There's no, there's no fashion in phones anymore. But like back in the day when there used to be all kinds of different forms and some were kind of hip and cooler than others. Now everything's just basically a slab of glass that you wrap an otter box case around of to keep it yeah, protected. It's all just a Hershey bar, right? Just it, re- it really is. And all the fun and all the style comes from like what kind of case you stick around it. Right. Well, now Motorola is bringing fashion back in a, in a way that I hope works for them. Now, this is a crazy expensive phone. I will say foldable displays are not cheap. <laughs> this one clocks in right around 1500 bucks. Wow. Which, I don't know. I mean, people spend $1,200, $1,300 on iPhones right now. So I guess it's not it's dramatically out of the room. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and so there's that screen on the inside. There's also a screen on the top that can also do some other things, kind of like how the, the old Razer had a screen on the top. This follows that. There's a little screen on the top of the new one that can show, and it's touch screen, so it can do things on that little screen as well. But I, what, a cool, what a cool trend to see some of the old designs kind of coming back with the new technology. Um, so anyway, so that was my museum pick, the Motorola Razer, uh, my tech pick. Coincidentally, the Motorola Razr, just uh, significantly newer and far more advanced and far cooler. Rich, how many are you going to buy? <laughs> At 1,500 shot? Uh, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> probably not. But uh, I don't know. Rob, what do you think? You going to get one of these? Yeah. Let's go back to part of our earlier conversation. There's just certain entities that I don't want my data exposed to, so... I'm going to keep it as limited and siloed as possible on my current platform. And I can appreciate the beauty of it. The thing looks great, but you know, again, privacy before presentation. So probably not a bad idea. Interesting move for Motorola though. Cause they've been kind of in this, what would you say? Like, um, well, of course now I'm like, Rich, why don't you talk while my phone rings? Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'll, I'll very quickly point out that um, this, uh, the part of why I was writing about the Razor in this white paper I was doing this week is that this whole folding screen phenomenon is kind of a big deal this year. So um, just this week, a few days ago, Samsung did its big annual um, Galaxy rollout and they introduced the S20, their new flagship phone, but they also um, introduced the Galaxy Z Flip um, which is a folding screen um, phone. Lenovo has a folding screen uh, laptop um, that you can use sort of in either orientation. You, you can use, you know, um, uh, you can have two displays basically showing different data. You can have one display and a digital keyboard, or you can flip it on the side and it becomes a kind of a digital book. So I, there are lots of different um, uh, design ideas and, and form factors in this Um, folding screen area um, coming out now. And I I think that's, and we saw even um, last year, Microsoft was kind of showing off some uh, dual screen, not necessarily folding exactly, but dual screen devices. I think we're going to see a ton of that um, uh, over the course of this year. Yeah, dual screen is definitely back in a a big way. And what I was mentioning before, it's kind of a departure for Motorola too, who's kind of found a niche uh, after being acquired by Lenovo, um, they've kind of found the niche in this being this like high value, not super high end, but high value kind of low cost phone. I um, mean, you know, not, not all of them were like, you know, a hundred bucks. They had some, some nicer ones, but they've always tried to go for that value market. This is a radical departure for them to go into this super premier, super high end, super cutting edge uh, kind of style. And, I, and I, I think you're right, Rich. I think dual, I think folding screen is going to be a is going to be a thing. Now, whether or not they're durable enough to last, that still has yet to be seen. Uh, after folding these things uh, a trillion times over, but just fold one about cool. hip height and see how it bounces. I mean, you know. <laughs> if it uh, if it doesn't smash in its four thousand pieces, it might last, right? Yeah, we'll see. There's a lot of uh, interesting questions about around the technology, but uh, it certainly seems like it's being perfected enough where they can throw it in fifteen hundred dollar phones. <laughs> So anyway, that's my uh, museum and tech pick. Rich, why don't you tell us what has been and what will be? Um, Well, you know, if if you want to know what has been, 
Um, the best place to do that is uh, channelpronetwork.com, specifically our In Case You Missed It post, which goes up every Friday on that site. Uh, it is written by our contributing editor, James Gaskin. This week, he will um, take you through some of the details about that uh, Samsung product rollout I just alluded to a little bit before. Um, there's a bunch of uh, security news from RSA um, as well that he's going to be talking about. So the RSA conference coming up in a couple of weeks, RSA kind of getting out in front of uh, all the exhibitors that are going to be at that show to uh, do a little security news of its own early. Um, uh, James will tell you all about that. Um, in terms of um, what will be, what, what to look ahead to next week, it's actually kind of a slow week um, in terms of uh, conferences and, and big news hooks. There will be some news stories uh, breaking that I can't really get into now. Um, but nothing, uh, nothing major going on um, th that I know of anyway at this point, which is probably a good thing um, because RSA, like I said, coming week after next, and that is going to be just a, a news tsunami. Uh, and an and, and interesting thing, um, uh, RSA was supposed to take place the same week as the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. That event has been canceled now because of concern over uh, coronavirus. Um, it will be interesting to see, though, if all the vendors who are um, uh, planning to present new products there are just going to go ahead with those uh, news releases uh, anyway, which I imagine they will. So there, there could be a ton of mobile news coming up in a couple of weeks. Looking forward to it, not to getting coronavirus, but to uh, <laughs> more news and uh, interesting articles next week. Rob's, Rob's laughing. He's like, yeah, I'm, I, that's weird. I was looking forward to getting coronavirus. I don't know about you. Uh, you know, it's 2020, <laughs> right? Here we are. The things, the things that excite us uh, these days. So, um, well, good. That's going to wrap up episode 134. For those who were listening along and or watching on uh, YouTube, I suppose, if you, if you want to learn more about the, some of the, the new stories and articles that we're talking about, we put um, the links to all of those on our show notes page at channelpronetwork.com. Find the page for episode 134, and then you'll be able to see that because we, we kind of touch on these, but there's a lot more detail and information in these articles and stories that you'll definitely want to want to check out. And if you're watching on YouTube, pop up in the description area. Again, same thing. We put links to all of those stories in there as well. Uh, if you would like to uh, uh, follow Channel Pro Network on the social medias, we are Channel Pro Network on Facebook and LinkedIn, at Channel Pro SMB on Twitter. And for those who, uh, who might be new to Channel Pro Weekly and are interested in, uh, in making sure they're always up to date and getting new episodes, the best way to do that is to subscribe. Go to, uh, go to um, uh, Rich, what's the place? Google Play, Google Podcasts. That's, that's one of them. I knew that. Apple Podcasts. We're now on Spotify uh, at long last. So if you're on Spotify, you can subscribe to us there. We're on Stitcher. Basically, anywhere where podcasts are aggregated, subscribe. That way, when, no matter where you are, if you're on the, on the boat, on the car, in the train, wherever you're at, uh, you, can, uh, you can get new episodes sent down to you immediately. I bet Rob is subscribed, aren't you, Rob? Oh, absolutely. Totally. And, and if he's not... He will be after today. Uh, if you like the video, if you like to watch us or you like the video version, we are on YouTube. You can subscribe to us there. Do that. Hit the bell and then I think all and then that'll make sure you get notifications for everything uh, that Channel Pro does. I believe including the awesome five minute roundup with Rich Freeman and Eric Simpson, which is definitely worth watching. Rob, if you, uh, if you <coughs> were going to give people information on how to find you on the interwebs, where would you send them? www.blockworks.com, spelled B as in boy, L-O-K-W-O-R-X.com. And are you on any of these social networks? Yeah, LinkedIn, at RP Bowles, and also uh, Twitter, RP, at RP Bowles. And, you know, security and mixed in with some uh, just thoughts on the existence of our time, so... Appreciate I cannot that. wait. I, you are going to be my number one follow. I <laughs> promise you that. I think you and I have a very similar mindset on a lot of things. Uh, Rich, if people want to follow you on, uh, on the social spheres, where would you be? Well, on Twitter anyway, I'm at Rich Free. And if you want to follow me, I'm at Matt Whitlock on Twitter, so make sure you do that. And of course, tune your homepage to channelpronetwork.com each and every day where we have uh, news articles, white papers, resources, downloads, all kinds of great, great stuff for you, the MSPs and VARs and integrators out there. Uh, it's a wealth and it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Make sure that you do that. Thank you so much to Mr. Rob Bowles from Blockworks for joining and being our uh, guest host today. Hopefully we'll, we'll have you back. Hey, I had a blast with you guys. Way more fun than I anticipated. So thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's great. That's great to hear. We try to keep it uh, informative and fun. 
as uh, as most people know. So uh, that is going to wrap it up for episode 134. We will see you all next week. Thank you.